Hello. This video is going to help you to tackle question 7b, which as we all know is big fun. Big fun under the sun. Well, that's my quota of sarcasm exhausted for the day, let's be honest. Question 7b is an awful question. Uh, 15 to 20 minutes, 14 marks, prepping and writing a comparative analysis of two texts. That's a big ask. And you're no slack jaw dolt just because you don't fancy going toe to toe with the hardest question on the exam paper. I mean, I'll be honest, question 7b reduces grown men to whimpering, blubbering puddles. Luckily, this video is going to show you some surefire steps, some tried and tested tricks to ensure that you can claw as many marks from this beast as possible. Now, the thing with question 7b, the wording of that question tends to be fixed from year to year. Obviously they change the last word or phrase depending on whatever links or unifies that year's two texts. And given the fishy nature of the two texts I'm serving up to you today, I reckon the examiner could frame the question thus. Um, compare how the writers of both texts present ideas and perspectives on aquatic creatures. And this text, text one, this extract is about a bloke fighting for his life against a big bone crunching shark. Jaws against oars. And here's our second text. It's an extract plucked from an article on ponds. Now, given that the focus of our question is aquatic creatures here, uh, when you read the article, you will see that we can extend our attention to include frog spawn, as well as fish. Any reference to either of those two underwater wanderers can find its way into our answer booklet. Now ideas, as we shall see, is a reassuringly broad concept. I mean, I guarantee every year an examiner must come across dozens of acceptable ideas off of different students in response to question 7b. And of course, it's different than 7a because you can look for similarities and differences. A lot of people hate this question, and rightly so. But don't panic. Keep your wig clips in. The examples of ideas that I'm now going to pluck from the two texts will help to clarify what to look for and what to analyse under the banner of ideas. Now, I'm about to winkle out about three ideas that connect these two texts. But before I do, maybe as you want to freeze the screen, see if you yourself can't discern references and concepts that work here. When it comes to the depiction of aquatic creatures, what similarities, what differences manifest themselves here. Okay, well, in the first text, text one, we've got a reference to the appearance of the shark's fin. It's described as a strange beauty. Uh, text two, anything in that relating to appearance? Got it. You've got the neon dart of the goldfish. That's appearance. Bing. We've got our first connection, which we can go on to analyse. Uh, how these creatures look, that's our idea here. Uh, any more for any more. Um, okay, so you've got the shark's fin slicing through the water. That's movement. Is there anything that parallels that in text two? Uh, you've got the neon dart, but I kind of already used that evidence. I want to use something different, ideally. Got it. Uh, when the daughter is shoving that big gelatinous lump of frog spawn in the mum's face, it's described as a writhing fistful of tadpoles. There's an image to put you off your Weetabix. However, writhing is movement, slice is movement, ding, connection, we've got another fruitful link that we can forge here. Uh, any more for any more last orders now? Um, okay, we've got the text two describes the pond as a soap opera because such violence and bloodshed occurs in it. You know, this is a million miles away from Sylvanian families, that cuddly view of nature. Nature here, very red in tooth and claw. And of course in text one, your man describes the shark as a killing machine. So another connection violence or bloodshed or danger there. Mr. Taylor, you eagle-eyed idea seer, you. So, three connections, three 
links, six quotations. Uh, next, we need to think about how each of these quotations presents its idea. And then I think we're, we're ready to fill in that answer booklet. booklet. You know, we're, we're ready, we're ready for the floor. So, feast your eyes on this lovely model exam paragraph. I've taken my quotation from text one, and later on, my quotation from text two, and I've looked at the effects, I've analysed the effects of them both. I've filleted the fish, you might say, though you probably think I'm talking Codswallop. Anywho, we'll read it, and then I'm going to swipe through a few streaks of highlighter just to draw your attention to what I'm doing here to earn the good graces, the good grades of the examiner. Right, well the paragraph kicks off with the word both. That's not a bad start to a comparative paragraph, is it? It's a certain and initial similarity before we veer off to consider difference later on. Also, I've tonked in that word idea. Let's make it easy for the examiner. Ideas he wants, ideas will he get. And of course, the specific concept or idea that this paragraph is going to explore is the idea of the creature's appearance. After that, we'll earn a short, appropriate quotation. And you'll notice that I've woven that quotation into a sentence of my own words. Then, and this is the clever bit, this is where we earn our marks, folks. Remember the question. The question said, compare how two texts present an aquatic creature. Well, here we're explaining how the writer presents the shark's appearance. And strange beauty, that adjective strange, is suggesting there's something eerie or unsettling about that shark's appearance. It's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Strange beauty. Uh, looking at language and structure, that's our writer's shape, meaning and effect. So let's deconstruct that in our explanation. Then I chuck in a connective, however, that asserts that I'm going to explore a difference. And what I'm going to roll out is another quotation, this time for text two, the neon orange dart. That's asserting the idea of appearance in text two. Again, that's embedded and it's an appropriately succinct quotation, neon orange dart. Then I'm going to analyse that noun neon. Look at how language shapes meaning or creates effect. And of course, neon, it just suggests that this goldfish is very bright. I don't mean like he's, you know, getting a scholarship to Oxford University. I mean, he's bright and he's very colourful. Um, there we go. I won't bother reading this one out. This paragraph looks at that idea of danger we considered a few slides back. You know, the idea of these creatures as deadly little critters. The colour-coded key works very well here, mind. Um, it's the same tricks as before, but I'm perhaps a bit more explicitly showing the best practice, the steps you do well to employ, illuminated in all the colours of the rainbow. Four of them anyway. Don't forget, I'm analysing language and structure here, because in my explanation, I want to ram home how that idea of danger is presented in both texts. Before we knock off for the day, let's ditch the fish and look at these two short sections from two different texts on horror movies. Now this is a resource that I normally use to teach question 7a skills, but in the spirit of question 7b, can you see an idea that appears in both texts, but again, perhaps is treated differently by the two writers? Maybe freeze the screen for 10 seconds or so, because I'm going to give the answer away now. Well done if you got that. You've got the public's appetite or hunger for slasher films. And you've also got the lad's uh, taste for low grog. He's a bit of a booze hound, loves his whiskey. And finally, though I'm not going to read it out and I'm not going to colour code it, pain in the posterior though that may be, here is a 7B response based on those two horror-related texts that we looked at. Um, I've taken that idea of appetites and I've run through my steps producing this winner. We're going to have a very enamoured examiner on our hands, I'm telling you now. And that's your lot, folks. Question 7b, the idea side of things, tackled. By golly, it all went swimmingly. Yes, it's the hardest question on the paper. You're comparing, you're analysing. Each in the exam, you've still got the writing section to contend with before your race is truly run. But we now know how to fish out ideas in order to hook ourselves the highest marks. And I'll start with those fish jokes now. I'm sure you packed the gills with them. I'm starting to take the Pisces a bit now, aren't I? Anywho, I'll leave you.
you good people to your day. I wish you the very best of luck in that example.